Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code, or UCC, applies to the sale of goods over $500. It doesn't apply to the sale of land or services. It does modify the common law of contracts in certain areas, especially if one of the parties is a merchant. Some definitions from the UCC. A sale is the passing of title from a seller to buyer for a price. The price may be in cash or in other goods or services. Goods are defined as tangible and movable, but not land, services, or intangibles. Goods associated with land, or goods and services combined, then we take a look at the uh, predominant factor test. If it's primarily for goods, then the UCC would apply. A merchant. A merchant is somebody who deals in goods of the kind sold and is presumed to possess a high degree of expertise. A merchant could also be somebody who holds himself out as a merchant who has special skill or knowledge or a person who employs a merchant. Uh, Article 2A is for leases. It applies to commercial and consumer leases. Uh, the lessor is the one who's selling um, the right to possess and use goods, and the lessee is the one who acquires those rights. The UCC modifies the common law of contracts. Uh, when the UCC speaks, it preempts the common law, and where it's silent, the common law would govern. That's a little different than the common law concept of offers in that it allows open terms. Under the UCC Article 2, an offer may include open terms as long as the parties intend to form a contract, and there's a reasonably certain basis for the court to grant remedy. The only thing that the court can't do is create a quantity. If quantity isn't specified, a court will deem the contract unenforceable because it cannot objectively determine the quantity. Now, there is some exceptions to that. You could have an open quantity term uh, if it's a requirements or output contract. In a requirements contract, the buyer agrees to purchase what the buyer needs or requires. In an output contract, the buyer agrees to purchase whatever the seller can produce or output. Acceptance. Under the UCC, a seller can specify the manner of acceptance. If none is specified, any reasonable means will do. A promise to ship or a prompt shipment of conforming goods is considered acceptance, too. Uh, shipment of non-conforming goods. This means the goods don't conform to the contract. In that case, prompt shipment of non-conforming goods is both an acceptance and a breach. In other words, it's the uh, shipper's indication that they accept um, but if it's non-conforming, it's a breach, unless the seller notifies the goods are only an accommodation. This notice of accommodation must indicate that it isn't to form a contract, but instead is an accommodation. A notice of acceptance is required. If a unilateral contract is not accepted within a reasonable time with performance, then the offeror can treat the offer as lapsed before acceptance. Under the common law, there was the mirror image rule. Uh, any additional terms and acceptance would be uh, rejection. Uh, under Article 2, it dispenses with the mirror image rule. And it depends on whether there's a merchant involved. If there, one of the parties is not a merchant, then only the additional, I mean, only the original terms are accepted. The additional terms are not part of the agreement. If both parties are a merchant, then additional terms do form a contract unless they're prohibited or the new terms or terms materially alter the contract or the parties object to the additional terms. And that acceptance could be conditioned on officers, an offeror's assent when an offeror contains additional or different terms expressly conditioned on the offeror's assent. No contract is formed without that assent. Uh, additional terms could be stricken. Conduct of both parties may be sufficient to create an enforceable contract, and the court will simply strike the terms of the contract on which the parties do not agree. Uh, looking at the common law idea of consideration under the UCC, modifications are treated a little differently uh, under the common law if there was any modification it needed to be supported by consideration under the UCC uh, 
as long as the modification is made in good faith, it can be made without consideration. Uh, if it is a modification without consideration, it must be written unless the uh, contract prohibits that. If a consumer is dealing with a merchant, then the consumer must sign a separate acknowledgement and any modification that brings a contract under the UCC to statute of frauds. Statute of frauds does apply under the UCC. A uh, contract for sale of goods over $500 must be in writing, but the writing uh, is sufficient if it just is signed by one party and indicates the party intended to form a contract. Basically, it needs to be signed by the party against whom it's uh, going to be enforced against. Special rules between merchants. Um, if there's a written confirmation after oral agreement, that would be sufficient. The, that confirmation must indicate the terms. Merchant receiving it must acknowledge or have knowledge of the content of that confirmation. And the receiver has 10 days to object. There are some exceptions to this writing requirement. If it's specially manufactured or custom goods, if the party admits um, on the record that there was a contract or this partial performance, for example, an exchange of money or delivery, Parole evidence rule basically requires um, the court to look at the written agreement and to not allow um, additional oral testimony that contradicts that written agreement. Maybe some cases where evidence, oral evidence is needed to um, explain something in the contract that's uh, ambiguous. There also may be um, an induction of course of dealing and usage or course of performance uh, in the past to show what the party is intended. It's also unconscionability. And this means the contract's so unfair and one-sided that it would be unreasonable to enforce it. Take a look at case 10.2, Jones v. Star Credit Corp. In that case, um, an elderly woman purchased a uh, refrigerator for much more than the value and the court determined that um, at some point it was unconscionable and that she had already paid for it. So there are some other alternatives. The court could um, just refuse to enforce the contract, but it could also enforce the contract without the unconscionable clause or limit the impact of the contract to avoid the unconscionable result. Title and risk of loss. Uh, sale of goods requires a different rules than real property transactions. Risk should not always pass with title. In other words, uh, sometimes property may uh, be in someone else's hand, but the risk of loss may still be with the other party. Uh, so title and risk of loss typically go together, but the parties can agree when title and risk of loss passes. The UCC replaces the common law notions of title with identification, risk of loss, and insurable interest, which we'll go into more detail into. And before title can pass to goods from the seller to the buyer, they need to exist and be identified. Identification occurs when the specific goods are de designated as the subject matter of that particular contract. Uh, it gives the buyer the right to obtain insurance on the goods and to recover damages from a third party. So. Uh, more than one party could um, insure goods. If they're existing goods, then identification takes place at the time the contract is made, uh, and there are different rules for uh, future goods or goods that are part of a larger mass. Passage of title. Title passes when the parties agree. If they don't agree, under Article 2, Section 401, title of identified goods passes to the buyer at the time and place the seller physically delivers the goods. Uh, 
and you can see uh, an example of that in case 10.3. Shipment and destination contracts. If there is an agreement about delivery, then delivery uh, arrangements are determined when the title passes. In a shipment contract, title passes at the time and place of shipment. In a destination contract, title passes when the goods are tendered uh, at the place of their destination. You also could have delivery without movement of the goods. In other words, um, title passes from one party to the other. Uh, with the document of title, they pass when the document is delivered. Without it, uh, when the sales contract is made, if the goods have been identified, or when identification occurs, they haven't been identified. There are some issues that come up with um, uh, thieves who um, steal property and then sell it or lease it, and this is uh, considered void title. In other situations, somebody might be holding onto a property and pass it on to a good faith purchaser uh, who doesn't have knowledge, and they would uh, then get title, and it would be up to the um, other party uh, to seek action against the, the seller. Uh, take a look at Exhibit 10-3 for uh, a breakdown of void and voidable title. Uh, when the contract fails to agree on when risk of loss passes, the courts determine whether um, it is a shipment contract. If it is, risk of loss passes when the seller tenders goods to the carrier. Uh, and if it's a destination contract, risk of loss passes when the goods are tendered at the destination by the carrier. In a situation involving delivery without movement of goods, if the goods are held by the seller, uh, then the document of title is generally not used. If the seller is a merchant, then the risk of loss passes when the buyer takes actual possession of the goods. If goods are held by a bailey, uh, for example, third-party warehouse, risk of loss passes when the buyers receive documents of title. Bailey acknowledges the buyer's right to goods and buyer receives title and has a reasonable time to pick it up. Uh, some cases, risk of loss passes um, when there's a breach of contract. If the seller breaches, for example, shipping non-conforming goods, then in that case, the risk of loss doesn't pass to the buyer until the seller cures the defect or the buyer accepts the non-conforming goods and weighs the right to reject. A buyer could revoke acceptance after they discover a latent defect. And in that situation, the risk of loss would pass back to the seller to the extent the buyer's insurance doesn't cover it. Risk of loss when the buyer breaches. After the goods are identified, the risk of loss passes to the buyer for a reasonable amount of time after the seller learns of the breach to the extent that the seller's insurance doesn't cover the loss. Insurable interest is basically um, when the buyer or seller has some interest in the goods that they can insure. A buyer has an insurable interest in the goods when they've been identified. A seller has an insurable interest in the goods as long as they retain title or security interest. So even if they're not holding on to uh, the property directly, if they still have title, they have an insurable interest. So as I said earlier, both the seller and the buyer could have an insurable interest at the same time. And finally, it's um, the uh, CISG is the uh, basically the UCC at the international level. So we look at the CISG uh, when we're looking at international sale of goods. As long as the um, country is participating in the CISG, and you would need to look at the CISG in these different areas to see how it differs from the uh, UCC.